I have loved Seattle for a long period of time, and it's a very easy city to love. Although it is clear that, like many cities, for right now, it's going through a great deal of challenge. I want to start with this figure, which is a figure which I would routinely start talks, I would say, for a decade before uh, the pandemic came out. This is a picture of America's 3,000-odd counties. I have split them into tents, so each one of those dots represents 300 or so counties, and I have ordered them on the basis of their density level, because at their heart, cities are the absence of physical space between people. Cities are density, proximity, closeness. What the blue line shows is the relationship between incomes and density. The densest tenth of America's counties have incomes that are 50% higher than the least dense half of America's counties. This is something economists call agglomeration economies. The fact that we become more productive when we are enmeshed in a maelstrom of, ac of economic activity. The fact that we learn from each other, we collaborate with each other. All of these things happen in downtowns. The red line sh is perhaps slightly more surprising, which is the relationship between population growth between 2000 and 2010 and initial population density. The places with the least space added the most people. So whereas Americans at the start of the 19th century were leaving our dense enclaves on the eastern seaboard to populate the empty spaces between the oceans, at the start of the 21st century, instead of spreading out, we are clustering in. Now, this is partially about the productivity of cities. But at least as much, it's increasingly become about the fact that cities are places of pleasure. This is what Dr. Samuel Johnson, famous for his dictionary in the 18th century, was talking about when he wrote that when a man is tired of London, he is tired of life. This is London, right, uh, as, as joyful a place as one can find. And in some sense, you can see the high value that people place on the pleasures of London with that map. That map shows both pain and pleasure. It shows the ratio between prices, housing prices, and incomes. And you can see there are some parts of the UK and the North where that ratio is less than one or less than two. In London, of course, it's way over 10. Because, in fact, people are paying not just for jobs. They're paying for access to an amazing set of urban amenities, just like you have here in downtown Seattle. One more point about urban triumphs, although it's mixed together with tragedy. I have became convinced before COVID that America's largest unsolved problem was the massive increase in prime age joblessness in the, US, in the US. Because in fact, being jobless is actually vastly worse on almost every dimension than being even a low wage worker. Because jobs are not just about earnings. They're about a sense of purpose. They're about a sense of social connection. They're about structure. When I was born in 1967, 5% of America's prime age males were jobless. Prime age, by the way, is defined as 25 to 54, which as a 55 year old, you'll notice I find deeply offensive. Um, <laughs> For most of the past 10 years, more than 15% of America's prime age males have been jobless. Um, and that's not a spatially neutral fact. Look at America's eastern heartland, right? A swath that begins down in Mississippi and Louisiana, runs up through Appalachia, and ends in the cities of the Rust Belt. Look at the Pacific Coast, right? You will see there are lots of areas in Oregon and Washington uh, that are, in fact, at the high levels of America's joblessness. But I'll tell you, one of those counties that's not there, and you can see it shining through, it's King County, right? Because in a city like Seattle, even if you don't have an advanced degree from UW, right, there will be a job for you. You will be able to fit into the great urban service economy that flourishes for people who sell things, who work in leisure and hospitality, do lots of things where there is a future for ordinary people. I have a lot more trouble understanding what the future is for ordinary people in West Virginia. Um, now, all of these rosy things about cities, the opportunities of jobs, the, the flood of people, high housing prices, well, that's not always so rosy, um, then ran into this. Plague is an old companion of urban life. Cities are not just places that bring people together for positive things. Cities are, are places that, that also bring together negative things. Cities are the ports of entry for goods, for people, for ideas, and for viruses and bacteria. Now, I can't think of a city that was doing more to do exactly what we always would dream a city would do than Athens in the fifth century BCE. This is a city that seemingly has a genius on every street corner, right? That is doing amazing things in Greek drama, in creating history itself, in the arts, in democracy, in creating a whole mercantile economy in Eastern Mediterranean. This is what cities can do that are great and, they can, and it has, less, has left lasting imprints on Western civilization. And all that success 
military as well as economic, excited the rivalry of their very land-based, very non-mercantile, very non-urban rival Sparta. Sparta demanded that Athens step down from its leadership within the, the Greek city-states. Um, Pericles heard their ultimatum. Pericles, the leader of the Athenian democracy, was not a fellow to take guff from anyone, and he told them it was on, right? And so the Peloponnesian War began. Now, Pericles had a cunning plan for fighting the Spartans. It was to summon the Athenians and their Attic allies behind the walls of the city, trusting to those walls to keep out the Spartan warriors, and then sending out the vastly superior Athenian fleet to harass the coastline of the Peloponnesian Peninsula. Militarily, brilliant. But walls that can keep out enemy warriors may not be able to keep out a virus. And that's exactly what happened. Through the port of Piraeus into Athens crept something, we still don't know what, that devastated the city. Okay? In the dense confines of a city like Athens, the disease can spread like wildfire. And those are the two things that make cities so vulnerable. One, they are open to the world, and two, they are dense. Diseases move quickly across people, and so perhaps one-fourth of Athens' population died in a two-year period. That's a death rate about 100 times that that we've experienced from COVID-19. Thucydides, one of the two fathers of history who was there, describes a city that has gone amok, in which people live only for the day because they do not expect to be, be alive tomorrow. Now, Athens you know, gets through it, uh, but its glory is, in a sense, dimmed forever. Its battles for another 25 years, but it goes from being maybe the New York City of the uh, Eastern Mediterranean to, I don't know, being the Philadelphia to being the New Haven. Um, uh, its glory is, in a sense, dimmed forever. Um, this is what can happen when disease goes wrong, when cities don't protect themselves. Now, for the past 200 years, we have also had plenty of urban experience with pandemic. This shows the path of death rates in New York over the past two centuries. The early 19th century was an early era of globalization when clipper ships spanned the oceans, and it was also an early era of pandemic. Um, this shows some of the major punctuations of the early 19th century. You can see yellow fever, a mosquito-borne illness that emerges out of Africa in the late 17th and early 18th century, travels over to the Caribbean, travels to the uh, cities of the north, and then cholera, which emerges in a particularly virulent form in the Ganges Delta in 1817. It gets carried along with the English army, gets carried along by the Tsar's army, and it makes its way to our cities in 1832. Now, these cities were awful, not quite as awful as the plague of Athens, right? So these are death rates about 10 times that of COVID-19. But cities continue to grow. They continue to survive. And there's a big reason for that, and it relates strongly to the downtown uh, uh, Seattle. Uh, and the reason is that groups of citizens, ordinary people, came together to make their cities healthier, to build the kind of infrastructure that would protect New York City against the pandemics of the future. You can see here, there's a, there's a little line. Let's see if I can get this, this laser printer here, right here, Croton Aqueduct opened. In 1842, this took 20 years, right? This was a group of citizens who recognized that these, this flood of cholera, this flood of yellow fever was just decimating the city and that they needed to spend to get clean water in and to get the filth out, right? They didn't necessarily get the medicine right, but they understood the public health. They spent an enormous amount. America's cities and towns were spending as much on clean water in 1900 as our federal government was spending on everything except for the post office and the army. It was an enormous undertaking. It came from the ground up, right? And after enough effort, it worked. One thing to notice about this graph is the Croton Aqueduct was not enough. You notice that it took 25 years, right? After it, you're still having cholera epidemics. My great, 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 great grandfather died in 1849 from cholera, seven years after the uh, aqueduct opened. The reason for that was the last mile problem, right? P they were expecting that poor people would either go to, the, 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 uh, go to the, the hydrants and carry the water or pay for a connection. Tenement owners weren't willing to do it. Poor people continued to die, right? It wasn't until Dr. Stephen Smith an ordinary New Yorker led a survey of all the conditions that went wrong and organized a mass movement that you created the Metropolitan Board of Health that started imposing requirements on tenement owners to, to connect to the water system and fining them if they failed. That came from ordinary citizens. Ordinary citizens understanding that government isn't something that's over you, that's distant, but good government is something you make. And that's exactly how New York got, got healthy. In some sense, the 19th century and 19th century cities are a, in some sense a hinge of history. If you think about governments prior to 1800, all they really do is they kill people. Maybe they kill people on our side, but maybe they, they, be, they don't. Suddenly in the 19th century, city governments started to save people's lives, and it happened because ordinary citizens got involved and made it so. 
Now, for 100 years, we had a blessed century that was you know, almost completely pandemic free. And then all of a sudden, right, in early 2020, disease came again. The early moments for COVID were very urban in America. This is uh, April 30th, 2020. And you can see it's New York, it's Boston, it's Atlanta, it's Detroit. Okay, it's big, it's big urban areas, which are the ports of entry for the disease. Of course, an airborne pandemic, either COVID or the influenza pandemic of 1918, 1919, that can go anywhere. And of course, by November, it was in the Dakotas, right? Because it's airborne, not waterborne. Um, within cities, though, it didn't particularly move in the densest areas. And that's an interesting fact. So this is a map of the five boroughs of uh, New York. And you can see that, in fact, the areas that are the densest, that's here. This is Manhattan. This is Brooklyn Heights. These are where the buildings are the tallest. They had by far the lowest rates of the disease. The disease was centered in, in Staten Island, in uh, Upper Bronx, in Queens, right? What's going on? Why was it not where the buildings are tallest? Okay. Um, it's because that's where people change their mobility most. Okay. And it turns out that skyscrapers are perfectly safe ways to have density. There are other places where it's not true, right? So for example, in the slums of Mumbai, by July 2020, serological work found that more than one in two, right, 50% of Mumbai residents had already had COVID. But in the dense skyscrapers of New York, it wasn't true. And it wasn't true because they re reduced their mobility, right? Uh, we, our estimates are that a 10% reduction in mobility during this time period, and you can see the reductions in mobility here. We know this from cell phone records provided by SafeGraph. A 10% reduction in mobility during these early months before we had masks, before we had vaccines, was associated with a 20% reduction in disease. Now, why did those people in the city center, why were they able to restrict their mobility? because they were educated, because they had you know, jobs that enabled them to work remotely, because they weren't in essential industries. And I think it's important when we think about Zoom, and it's part of why we want our downtowns to come back, right, is that working remotely was never a democratic thing. This is May 2020, right, when you know, I think the majority of people, the overwhelming majority of people in this room were likely to be remote, right? 68.9% of Americans with advanced degrees were working remotely, right? What share of American high school dropouts were working remotely in May 2020? 5%. What share of Americans who didn't get past high school working remotely? 15%, right? And so if you imagine a world in which all of our offices are empty, our downtowns are empty, and we're all zooming in, that's a world that is even more awfully unequal than the world that we had before COVID. Um, this is sort of an amazing fact, which is because of this link between the ability to self-protect and education, the death rates from COVID look totally different in educated and uneducated parts of America, right? And so this is just looking across large metropolitan areas, right? That's a fourfold difference between a place like Seattle, where, you know, as we, as we learned, the fentanyl deaths are worse than the COVID deaths, right? To a place like L Las Vegas, where, uh, or Riverside, or Oklahoma City, or San Antonio, where the COVID deaths were about four times that in, uh, in Seattle. Education is predictive of many things that go right in cities. And in fact, the greatest blessing that Seattle has is its human capital, is its skills. Now, this pandemic and was associated with a different outcome than in the past, economically as well as health-wise, because our economy has changed. So 650 years ago, when the Black Death came back to Europe, it hit an, an economy that was marked by subsistence agriculture, in which people got their wealth from the soil. Now, when a pandemic comes in and kills a third of the population, as this incredible human tragedy does, it means that the amount of land left is much larger per person. It means the demand for labor soared, and wages you know, went through the roof in the late 14th century after this, after this pandemic. In fact, the, the extra earnings that people had helped fuel the boom for luxury goods that gave us the urban renaissance of the 15th century. Flash forward to 1918, 1919, the industrial economy, right? This economy also you know, was hit with the influenza pandemic. It is true that mines shut down temporarily. It is true that factories were faced dislocations, but people didn't stop buying ice boxes or cars because of the pandemic. Not then, not now, and so the factories came back. Move forward 100, 100 years, where factory jobs are gone, automation and outsourcing, and the ability to serve a cappuccino with a smile has become an employment safe haven for people who don't have fancy degrees. Right? The danger is that as soon as that smile becomes a source of peril rather than a source of pleasure, right, those jobs can disappear in a heartbeat. Or so I worried early on. It turns out that thanks to $4 trillion in federal spending, Right? That in fact, what happened was not so much a lack of demand for those jobs, but an unwillingness to supply those jobs. The great resignation, uh, as it were. And that, in some sense, is something that we're still dealing with. And when we do face an economic recession, as we will at some point in time, right, we'll have to see how this plays out. 
Now, I'm now going to switch to what I know about the way that the economic impacts of COVID and then the following Zoom revolution impacted different cities. Um, this comes from the introduction of my, of my book with David Cutler on survival of the city. We measured urban winners and losers using four measures, wages, employment, housing price growth, and permit growth. We just averaged those things together. We did a little bit of correcting for variation, and we got some facts, okay? And I'll just show you where the rankings are and where Seattle comes in it. A couple of facts look like the past 70 years on steroids. First of all, wage growth was faster in more educated places. It has been so over the past 50 years, right? Economic change has favored skills, and it was particularly true over this time period. Amazingly high wage growth, particularly in the California areas, but also Seattle. Employment growth goes to the Sun Belt. You know, there's a basic fact that there's no variable that better predicts metropolitan area growth over the past 120 years than January temperature, right? Uh, and it continues to be, uh, continues to be true. Um, the New Orleans being the one glaring exception. Where does Seattle come out in here? Uh, Seattle comes out number 14 right, out of the top 50. So it's doing all right. Okay, this is the metropolitan area as a whole. It's not the particular downtown. Uh, it's doing pretty well in terms of wages. Every, it's doing better on wages than any other place other than the San Francisco uh, and LA, LA areas. Um, doing less well on employment growth. Um, let me just show you what the, in general, this is dominated by the Sun Belt. So 17 out of the 25 in the top, the top half of this list are in the Sun Belt. Austin, Texas, Phoenixville, Arizona, those are the leaders of the list. Those are the places that have done magnificently well. And those are the places that as we think about retaining talent for Seattle, that's what we need to worry about. I, I love the fact that we had Erie, Pennsylvania, and Detroit on the, those lists. That's not the places you need to worry about. It's Austin, Texas, Miami, uh, and, and uh, Phoenix. Um, this is the bottom of the list. Now, this is filled with a lot of rust belt, you know, places that have been doing badly for 50 years. But there's something anomalous about this, which is the large size of cities like New York, Washington, D.C., and Chicago enabled them to float above most of the Northeast over the past 50 years. They did unusually badly during the past three years. They did much, much worse. And so they're really at the bottom of the list apart from uh, New Orleans. Um, another way of looking at what's happened, of course, is with housing prices. And this is uh, it's a repeat sales index uh, over the past 40 odd years. And as you can see, based on where you started in 1977, Seattle actually outpaces all of America's large, large cities. It's really quite amazing, and it it's, you know, did particularly well during the past three or four years. There are upsides and downsides in that, but it shows the demand to be in the Seattle metropolitan area remains robust. The demand for offices, a little less clear. This comes from the Kidder Matthews market report. You can see vacancies going up. You can see rents going down. Um, and the big question that we're all facing is when or will we all ever go back to work? This is for 10 large markets. This comes from Castle Technologies. Uh, these guys do card swipes to get into buildings. Shows you know, less than 50% of people going to, back to these fancy downtown offices. This number is less bad than overall coming to work. I also have Google Mobility data. This shows people just going into any workplace. This is the largest county associated with the city, so Maricopa for Phoenix and King for uh, Seattle. Um, Seattle is one of the two places on the bottom there. Okay, so Seattle is down there with New York. The, high the highly educated workforce of Seattle has been particularly prone to using Zoom, which means that you have this problem uh, particularly uh, uh, strongly. Changes in recreation, though, not so much. Seattle doesn't look like New York. It doesn't even look like, like Chicago. It actually looks much better. The demand to be in this place for pleasure remains robust, even if the demand to be in offices does not. And public transit uh, usage, Seattle looks like it's about the middle of the pack. The only place that looks really unusual on this is Houston. Now, when we think about Zoom and the future of the city, I think it's helpful to have real historical perspective. Technological changes have always shaped our urban areas, right? There are both technologies that are centripetal, that pull us together, and technologies that are centrifugal, that pull us apart, right? This is a centripetal technology, the aqueduct, which enabled the building of large cities by the Romans. Throughout most of the 20th century, centrifugal technologies were dominant. And 40 years ago, during this mess, during the period in which, which New York looked like it was headed for the trash heap of history, a futurist called Alvin Toffler wrote in a book called The Third Wave that electronic technologies would make face-to-face -face contact and the cities that enable that contact obsolete, that our offices would become empty, that we would all depart from cities, and you know, everything was gonna, gonna disappear. Very similar to things that we've heard now. Um, and he was living during a great centrifugal age during which technologies like the car and radios and television had made it less necessary to be in a city to catch a fun show or to uh, find a job. In some sense, the big fact over the 20th century was the decline in the cost of moving goods 
right? So this, this just shows the over 90% drop in the cost of moving a ton of mile by rail. So whereas older cities like New York City or Chicago were anchored by access to their ports and access to their rail yards, by the end of the 20th century, that was irrelevant. And former dominant industries, right? The largest industrial cluster in the United States in the 1950s was not cars in Detroit. It was guys selling dresses in New York City, right? They lost hundreds and hundreds of thousands of jobs over a five-year period, right? And all of these were the 10 largest cities in, in the US, and these are actually the central cities themselves, right? They all experienced an awful 30 years, right? Some of them managed to come back after 1980. Some of them, like Cleveland, Detroit, St. Louis, still has, have not. And of course, in the 1970s, Seattle wasn't immune to this, right? In 1971, two jokers put up a billboard leaving the city, asking the last person to leave Seattle to please turn out the lights, because just as no one could imagine a Detroit with a smaller Boeing, as with a Detroit with a smaller General Motors, no one could imagine a Seattle with a smaller Boeing, and Boeing had been laying off jobs. It's before Amazon, before Costco, before Starbucks, before Microsoft, right? Seattle looked like it was, it was finished. But of course, that's not what happened. This shows employment in the greater Seattle area. The top one is relative to San Francisco. You can see, you know, San Francisco is arguably the most productive place on the planet. Not only is Seattle keeping up, it's getting closer, right? So despite all of these prognostications, Seattle managed to turn itself around to an amazing degree. So why didn't these fancy IT uh, tools of the 1980s kill urban knowledge industries? You know, this is the Wallace office at Bloomberg LLP. This is the former Google complex. It's quite simple, because what all these revolutions in technology did, what globalization did, is it radically increased the returns to being smart. It radically increased the returns to innovation. And we are a social species that becomes smart by being around other smart people. This is the tragedy of young people not coming into the office, because they are the people who should be there to learn. This is how you actually learn how to do your job, to be around people who actually know how to do it, right? Um, and the more complicated the world is, the easier it is for ideas to get lost in translation. Anyone who's ever taught knows the hard part about teaching is not knowing your subject. It's knowing whether or not anything is getting through to your students. And we have evolved over millions of years to have these cues for communicating comprehension or confusion that are lost when we're not in the same room with one another. Now, the ability of cities to enable us to learn from one another, to work from another, explains why some cities have done much better than others. Seattle is doing exactly as well as its human capital says it should, right? 65% of Seattle's adults have college degrees. Something like 15% of Detroit's adults do. They are both doing exactly as well. This is, the, the fact that you are surrounded by skilled people makes you much more productive. This just shows the relationship between per capita GDP and share of adults with a college degree. As the share of adults in your area with a college degree goes up by 10%, your earnings typically go up by 10% too, holding your years of schooling constant. This is something economists call human capital externalities, the benefits of having someone smart to employ you, to buy from you, to sell to you, to give you an idea. Um, this shows the relationship between population growth and initial skill levels. So skilled areas have generally managed to boost both wages and population. Now, skills are not just the skills that you learn in colleges. They are the skills that are learned at the office, on city streets. They're what the great English economist, Alfred Marshall, was writing about in the 19th century when he wrote that in dense clusters, the mysteries of the trade become no mystery, but are, as it were, in the air. Right? And I can't think of any skill or talent that is more valuable for the long-run resilience of a city than the ability to be an entrepreneur, the ability to find something new to do, to find a new way of employing people, to find a new product to sell. 60 years ago, the economist Benjamin Chinitz was comparing New York and Pittsburgh and noting that New York was more resilient than Pittsburgh even then. He argued that this was a legacy of New York's garment industry, which was a mother of entrepreneurship in which anyone who wanted to get started could and could learn how to become an entrepreneur. By contrast, right, Pittsburgh had U.S. Steel. U.S. Steel trained company men, and they were great at logistics in the short run, but look, when U.S. Steel founded, they wouldn't know how to start an electronic greeting card company. They wouldn't know how to do something else. They were company men. It is amazing, given how bad our measures of entrepreneurship are, that they do such a good job of predicting urban resilience. This just shows the relationship between average establishment size and subsequent employment growth between 1977 and the next 25 years. Lots of little firms, good growth. A few dominant firms, bad, okay? You want to be a, a place in which it's easy to start a business. Now, what do we know about productivity, learning during a time of COVID? We have multiple studies that look at call center workers and what happens when they get sent home. Both studies find exactly the same thing, okay? When you send call center workers home, they can just make just as many calls. They know how to do it, okay? 
Both studies also find that your probability of being promoted if you're a call center worker goes down by over 50%. What's going on? Why aren't these remote workers getting, getting promoted? Well, what it means to be promoted is you get to handle difficult calls. How would you learn to handle the difficult calls if you were all alone? How would your boss learn that you were good at, at doing them, right? All that learning channel is shut down. Right? And that's what we're losing when we're going remote. Um, the, the Microsoft, right, told us initially that sending people uh, remote was not doing anything to the productivity of their, uh, their software programmers. A more recent study by Sonia Jaffe and her co colleagues looks at what happens when you go remote. I'll just read from the abstract. Our results show that firm-wide remote work caused the collaboration network of workers to become more static and siloed, um, with fewer bridges between disparate parts. Furthermore, there was a decrease in synchronous communication and an increase in asynchronous communication. Together, these effects may make it harder for employees to acquire and share new information across the network, right? Third piece of evidence. What happened to new hiring during COVID, right? So on, on your left is those jobs that could be done, that had to be done live. You'll see when COVID hit, drop in employment, drop in new hirings as measured by burning glass technology. On your right are those jobs that can be done remotely, right? Employment, which is the red line steady, new hires down by 40% and they stayed down, okay? People were not willing to onboard new workers if they were not gonna be there in person because the learning channel is shut down. And I can say after you know, years now of studying what's going on with remote schooling, right? This is something that is somewhere between disastrous and unbelievably awful, right? What we've done to our kids by making them go remote. I think in the long run, uh, uh, in the long run, what this means is that density is not over. Proximity is not over. Face-to-face -face contact is not over, right? right? People have to realize that, you know, we are social. It is what we do. And for our jobs to be joyful, we will need to be live in the office. But I do fear that Zoom means more competition for global talent than ever. It has never been easier for firms to relocate, right, and to find something else. And that means that every city needs to bring their A game if they want to retain talent, okay? This is not the time to think that all of a sudden your labor is fixed, that you're sitting on everything. This is exactly what happened in the 1970s when highways and cheap transportation made it easier for people to relocate from cities like New York, right? During this time period, there were progressive dreams that started treating those firms and those people like they could just be taxed without uh, impunity, and they just left. And this was the background before uh, the city facing uh, near bankruptcy. When we think about Seattle and what are our assets, you've already seen the, the failure, the lack of people returning to the office, but the visitors are back. That again implies that the city's enduring asset is as a place of pleasure, a place of joy. So when I think about the critical things for the future of the city, I think quality of life strategy is economic development strategy, right? And you know, Seattle's skill levels are way above the national average, right? 38% of American adults as a whole have college degrees as opposed to that 65%. That is really critical. I mean, my mantra for economic development is to attract and train smart people and get out of their way. Good schools, safe, fast commutes remain central amenities. Seattle's commutes are relatively good relative to other big cities and they've gotten better because of the pandemic, right? That's, that is an asset. Fixing potholes is good too, but so are safe streets, right? Um, Seattle was at the forefront of the three strikes movement for, uh, 30 years ago, um, and it's also at the forefront with the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. Neither was completely wise, right? And of course, the fentanyl catastrophe is particularly awful. Um, working neighborhoods need also to be places of pleasure. The time to end Euclidean single-use zoning is now, right? In fact, we should be rethinking pretty much all of our zoning requirements that make it difficult to retool our cities for the future, to recognize that we need to change, right? I, I find it, we, I had a big part in the, in the new book actually about Ida Valasiotis because I thought the story of her daughter's tragedy, right? She was abducted right in Pioneer Square. She was killed by a, a repeat sex offender who never should have been out, right? Should build a little bit of sympathy for why we got three strikes, right? And she was completely right that people like the man who killed her, her daughter should have been locked out, should never have been out. But she then started arguing not just for three strikes for repeat sex offenders, but pretty much for everything. And that we ended up having the massive increase in total adult correctional population that you see there, which she's not entirely responsible for at all, but it's part of the general movement. We as a society need to be smart enough to differentiate between the three-time sexual predator, right, and a three-time marijuana dealer, right? They, they are a very different species of, of, and we are just a stupid country if we cannot do that, right? <laughs> Similarly, right, police reform is a real issue. Every citizen should have the right to be able to walk home without being afraid of being harassed by a cop just as every citizen should be able to walk home without being, looking over their shoulder being, for being, free, being afraid of being robbed. But if we want our police to deliver both courtesy and safety, we're not gonna be able to defund them. 
right? There's no such thing as a free lunch. If we want our cops to do more, and we should want our cops to deliver both of those things, we're gonna need to have more cops and we're gonna need to give them the resources they need to fix things. Seattle has budgeted 1.6 police per capita, right? It's got 1.3 police per capita. The large city norm is 2.6. Your police numbers are very low. And when you expect police to run on a shoestring, right, that risks demoralization, that risks a, a tendency to go too quickly to brutality, to go too quickly to violence, right? Be smart about policing. Invest in it, invest in ways that makes it not just effective, but that forms genuine partnerships with the community, which is what good policing looks like. This comes from downtown Seattle's poll. Largest problem people say that they have is homelessness. Um, it's not an easy problem to solve. I'm just gonna make one other comment. I'm just gonna say something that I'm just gonna throw out there and we can, we can talk about this, this later. But you know, this is where Seattle's revenues come from, okay? Sometimes it is very helpful for governments to see themselves as having two distinct components. A for-profit real estate development company that focuses on where the revenues are gonna come from and a non-profit poverty alleviation company. Do not confuse the two of them. Both of the things need to happen. If there are not revenues that come from the one entity, you cannot fight the curses of, of poverty with the other entity, right? And so it is absolutely crucial that whatever is done to fight fentanyl, it not be done in an area in which it turns away tourists, that it makes the downtown areas attractive, right? The problem needs to be taken seriously, but you know, that requires us to separate out the two functions of, of government. And I will just end on my last slide, which is, this is a hard moment, right? But cities are amazingly resilient. Okay, this is tough, but look at Milan in 1943. Look at what, what it is now, right? Seattle is a capital of the information age. It has a glorious future ahead of it. You know, in some sense, one way to think about this is that humanity has been doing miraculous things in cities for thousands of years, since Socrates and Plato bickered on an Athenian street corner. The age of urban miracles is not over, and it is going on right here in Seattle. Thank you very much.